This is Geology 100 Natural Disasters. My name is Dr. Scott Nowicki, and today's topic is supervolcanoes and caldera forming eruptions. We are already pretty familiar with the idea of pyroclastic eruptions. These are gas-rich, highly silicic magmas that when they erupt, they produce very violent events. There can be lots of ash and materials thrown into the air, tephra, pumice, as well as actual lava flows. When these big pyroclastic eruptions occur, these pyroclastic flows are often called nuées ardentes, or glowing clouds. They are incredibly dangerous, uh, gas-charged, semi-molten cloud of ash and lava that comes cruising down the mountainside at really high speeds. This is just one of the hazards associated with, for the most part, what we consider to be a stratovolcano-type eruption, a silicic magma-type volcano. Now these eruptions when they occur can of course be very dramatic. Lots of ash, lots of gas, big explosive eruptions that can devastate the landscape. And here's a scene showing just how much debris can be laid down in one of these pyroclastic flows. Now typically these are actually relatively narrow areas that we're talking about. Most stratovolcanoes are in there are on the order of kilometers to tens of kilometers in size. The reality is there can be much larger eruptions that when they go produce these things called calderas. So a caldera can form in eruptions that are for the most part predominantly silicic or rhyolitic in composition, the same composition that produces these stratovolcanoes. They are often volatile rich, very similar to stratovolcanoes, so there's a lot of gas and a lot of water carbon dioxide dissolved within the magma. And of course they often produce these widespread pyroclastic deposits. Fairly often these caldera eruptions are pretty complex. Sometimes there are gentle eruptions, sometimes there are large-scale eruptions, sometimes they're explosive, sometimes they are lava flows. They often tend to be long-lived volcanoes because the magma chamber is fairly large, so you get numerous eruptions over the lifetime of these volcanoes. But the key element is that these calderas are actually collapse features. This is an example of uh, Mount Mazama, which is also known as Crater Lake, or which is currently known as Crater Lake. Well, originally, you had this full magma chamber at depth, and it was a big magma chamber, and maybe it produced a stratovolcano on top. Pyroclastic flow after lava flow, pyroclastic flow after lava flow, actually deposited these layers into this relatively pointy volcano. Now, as a large-scale eruption occurs, lots of gas, lots of ash, and effectively magma gets dumped out of this magma chamber that the magma chamber empties. When that chamber empties, there is actually void space at depth. And at that point, the weight of all this erupted material on top actually collapses in on that magma chamber. These calderas are actually collapse features that occur from the emptying of these magma chambers during large volume eruptions. There are a number of these around, certainly a large number of them around the world. We're gonna focus on two. One of them is at Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone is actually a caldera itself. It is one large volcano that has had numerous eruptive events. The other one is at Long Valley Caldera in California. Now there are a number others. The example of Mount Mazamba is actually the Crater Lake volcano in Oregon. And there are a couple of other uh, caldera forming eruptions throughout the area. But we're gonna focus on two, just Yellowstone and Long Valley. We're going to focus on the hot spot of the Yellowstone caldera. So currently it's sitting here at the corner of um, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. But it turns out that that hot spot has been migrating over time. It's been sitting there for a couple of million years. But if you go back six million years, that hot spot was actually further to the west. It was in the middle of Idaho. You go back 10 million years, it was actually further west of that. This hot spot actually started 16 million years ago in the southeast corner of Oregon. This hot spot has been migrating over time, very similar, similarly to the Hawaiian hot spot. But this, of course, is blasting across the continental United States. So envision a hot spot starting in Oregon and then working its way across the western U.S. As it continues on, it will actually continue to work its way through uh, the United States. Now we can actually trace the this migration of the hotspot. Again, here's the 16 million year ago start of this hotspot. It then marched across what we refer to as the Snake River Plain. It is a low elevation area that is surrounded by all these volcanic uh, 
features. Really what's going on is this is this is effectively a, a, a heat source that's right underneath the continental crust and it's pushing along the continental crust very slowly. So it works its way to the eastern border of Oregon and it erupted and then it proceeded to slowly march its way into Idaho and it continued to erupt and of course it only pokes up through every so often. Of course these are long scales that we're talking about, 16 million years overall. But what we're witnessing today is our, our eruptions that are occurring in the current caldera. But as you work your way back you'll see that each of these are probably calderas that formed over time. So currently it's sitting here, will continue to work its way to the east, but we have evidence of the past three large-scale eruptions and they were about 630, 640,000 years ago, 1.3 million years ago, and 2 million years ago that produces the, produced these large-scale collapse features. So here is a map of the Yellowstone caldera. This orange line is the outline of the caldera itself. And you can see that this thing is massive. So here's Yellowstone Lake. If you go to Yellowstone National Park, it's really difficult to see the caldera. There are only a couple spots that you can visualize where this collapse feature occurs. Otherwise, it looks like a relatively low-lying uh, area with kind of rough topography. So that's why we kind of think of this as the sleeping giant, because it is a big volcanic center, but it only erupts every so often. Now, it's been a long time since we've had an eruption from Yellowstone, but it is still a currently active volcano. It could erupt either small scale or large scale in the near future. The eruptive history that we're most interested in are the past three big caldera forming and big ash depositing eruptions. The first one we're going to look at was about 2.1 million years ago that produced 2,500 cubic kilometers of magma. And this is the Huckleberry Ridge eruption. At 1.3 million years ago, it produced 280 cubic kilometers of magma. This is the Mesa Falls eruption. And then 640,000 years ago, 1,000 cubic kilometers of magma and the Lava Creek eruption. And so this 640,000 year event formed what we currently think of as the caldera. So as you can see, the, the volume of magma that erupts from these uh, calderas can vary widely. And it turns out that these are just, of course, the caldera forming events. There were a number of eruptions that occurred between all of these that produced small scale um, flows, basaltic cinder cones, rhyolitic domes, a number of different uh, eruptive styles during that time. If we look at a geologic map, that shows the age of the different rocks at the surface, we can actually see a wide variety of both compositions and ages within this. So again, this purple line is the outline of the current caldera that we refer to as the caldera. It's effectively the 640,000 year event. Within the caldera itself, there is a lot of material that erupted not that long ago. So 160,000 years ago to 70,000 years ago, there were non-caldera forming eruptions, large amounts of magma that actually reached the surface and flowed out. There are basaltic features on the fringes, but for the most part we're talking about rhyolitic compositions within the caldera. Now there are a number of faults through the region. It makes sense as these eruptions occur and as magma moves in and out, it moves rocks against each other and these faults accommodate that movement. So there have been lots of earthquakes over time as well. And an important one was in 1959. That was the Hebgen Lake uh, earthquake that actually caused uh, quite a bit of damage, but more importantly, uh, caused these landslides to occur. And people died in this event. But there have been lots and lots of earthquakes, and there are lots of earthquakes occurring on a regular basis within the Yellowstone caldera, which shows that even within the last couple of decades, there's a lot of activity. Even though the, the youngest volcanic materials are thousands of years old, we're seeing lots of activity today. Now if we look at the volumes of these at least three different caldera forming eruptions, they of course vary widely, but in comparison to most of what we think of in terms of volcanic eruptions, they were huge. They were absolutely massive. But here is a three-dimensional perspective of the volumes of magma that were erupted actually from a different number of different calderas. On the left is the 2.1 million year Huckleberry Ridge event 
In the middle here is the Mesa Falls ash with 280 cubic kilometers of material. We have the Yellowstone ash of Lava Creek eruption, about a thousand cubic kilometers. We also have the Long Valley Caldera eruption, otherwise known as the Bishop Ash event. And that occurred 760,000 years ago. Well, luckily, we've got these four biggest caldera forming eruptions in North America all kind of lined up to see just how massive they are. Now, if we compare them to events that we are more familiar with, let's say the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980, which by all accounts was a massive event. We watched huge amounts of, of ash being thrown into the atmosphere. A lot of material came out of the ground, landslides, a number of people died, but the reality is that was a really small event compared to these big caldera formers. These other events such as Pinatubo in 1991, uh, Novarupta in Alaska in 1912, the Krakatoa um, Indonesian eruption in 1883, these were, we consider them to be pretty catastrophic events, but compared to these caldera eruptions, they are just a drop in the bucket. We've mapped out where in the United States this ash has fallen because wherever this ash went up and then accumulated on the surface, in many places it actually accumulated into a rock layer. It landed when it was a fairly, a fairly it landed as a fairly coherent and accumulated as a coherent layer. And over time, it lithified into a distinct rock layer within the sedimentary record. So this is the current Yellowstone caldera. And these are the outlines of the different uh, ash falls that occurred. So we have this Huckleberry Ridge ash bed within here. We've got the Lava Creek ash bed that covered much of the western United States, almost halfway into the Midwest. And then we've got the Mesa Falls ash bed. So three different big eruptions that you can see distributed ash all over a lot of the continental United States. In comparison, here's Mount St. Helens and Mount St. Helens' ash deposit. Relatively small when we're talking about these caldera eruptions. Now also on here, this dotted, darker dotted line is the Bishop Ash Bed. That erupted from the Long Valley Caldera that's down here, which will be the second part of our lecture. You can see that also a very massively widespread area. Now of course, the ash wasn't meters thick out in the edge. We're talking about, for the most part, less than a centimeter thick. But close to the plateau, or close to the Yellowstone Caldera, and close to Long Valley, we have a record of meters worth of ash. So very significant events, a lot of material. We know that Yellowstone is currently active because we're watching it move. We have planes that fly over with radar, and over time they, they measure effectively the, the elevation of the, the surface of the ground. And what we've seen during the past couple of decades is an actual inflation and deflation of the ground around this Yellowstone caldera. For each color change in this map, when you go from blue to red through the spectrum, that means that 28 millimeters, a little bit more than an inch of topography change has occurred in that, in that area. So you can see that from the bottom here, blue to blue, that's 28 millimeters and here's another blue to blue that's another 28 millimeters and so we're talking about maybe about 60 millimeters worth of elevation change that has occurred in a relatively short period so this map is from 1996 to 2000 so this thing is moving on the order of a couple of inches per year now it's not continuing to, to inflate it actually inflates and sometimes deflates meaning that this magma is actually moving around in the subsurface we can watch it real time right now, watch this thing kind of breathe in and out as it expands and, and deflates as this magma moves underneath. The best guess as to what is going on is that there are actually a couple of different reservoirs. The main silicic reservoir, the felsic composition that if it erupts it will turn into rhyolite, is for the most part between 5 and 10 kilometers below the surface. So really that's probably what we're seeing is that moves around and that fills with magma. It is what's moving the ground up and down. Now in addition, there are all sorts of locations where there's a lot of water in the subsurface and this is a hydrothermal system. As this hydrothermal system changes and flows, 
it's actually probably to some degree changing local topography as well. If we go further deep into the crust, we can see that the source of this magma is probably basaltic to begin with. And so this is, this is where it gets pretty interesting because we have both basaltic magmas and basaltic lavas as well as rhyolitic magmas and rhyolitic lavas on the surface. And the best interpretation is that this basaltic magma is this hot spot coming up from the mantle. And as the mantle hits the bottom of the crust, it kind of gets stopped. It melts the rocks above it. So you can think of this mantle material pushing up to the bottom of the crust, that crust taking in that heat and melting, and that's what turns into this silicic magma. That when these big caldera forming events occur, they are the eruption from this magma chamber. But there is this source of heat that's coming from these mafic intrusions. Now at the same time, some of these mafic intrusions may actually make their way all the way to the surface, and that's what we saw on that map. That there is basaltic lava working its way on onto the surface in certain locations. There is going to be an eruption that forms this caldera. It's going to be this silicic magma chamber. Very sticky lavas, very gas rich. Therefore, when it erupts, it will produce very pyroclastic type events. We know that earthquakes are occurring on a regular basis. Thousands of small earthquakes rattle the Yellowstone region each year. Earthquakes can indicate magma movement, but they can also indicate tectonic stresses. The entire continental U.S., or at least the western U.S., is being stressed as the San Andreas Fault and the Pacific Plate kind of push against it. So there are small-scale stresses, or really large-scale, that turn into small-scale movements uh, that can also be producing earthquakes. Um, what we're finding is there really is not all that much correlation between earthquakes and eruptions. So there can be a bunch of earthquakes that occur, a swarm of earthquakes that might occur from time to time, but it doesn't necessarily mean that eruption is going to occur. So the biggest Yellowstone earthquake that occurred in recorded history was the Hebgen Lake event in 1959, had a magnitude 7.5, caused a landslide uh, that was actually fairly close to a campground and a number of people died. But other events have occurred relatively recently as well. In 1975, there was a 6.1 magnitude event. We could potentially, in the near future, certainly see magnitude 6s, magnitude 7s occur at any point. This doesn't necessarily mean that an eruption is imminent, but it certainly means that there is activity in the region, that it is not a dead volcano. There tends to be swarms of these earthquakes that occur over time. So here is this uh, timeline of movement, and we can see that there are a number of earthquakes that occur almost in this random pattern. Each of these bars represent uh, the number of earthquakes per quarter of the year. So you can see that through 1975, 76, 77, there was a swarm that occurred, and then things kind of calmed down into the 80s, and you get into 1985, 1986, and there was a big swarm that occurred, and what this is telling us is that something's going on. Stresses are changing in the region. They're producing these earthquakes. Now, at the same time, here is what was going on with the actual uplift of the caldera. From the 70s into the 80s, it was increasing, inflating at about 22 millimeters per year. And then as of 1985, there was actually a decrease. It was starting to subside at about 19 or 20 millimeters per year. And then it turned around somewhere around 1995, 96, and started increasing again. So when we look at this distribution of earthquakes and the actual uplift, it looks like seismicity is not a really good indication for an eruption, since we have not seen an eruption in, in recent history. What we're expecting from Yellowstone, but what we know right now is that we have these small-scale hydrothermal explosions, these hydrothermal events, geysers are changing, they're erupting, they're exploding, uh, but no actual lava on the surface. We have lots of small-scale earthquakes, but then a few, small, a few strong earthquakes every so often, maybe one per century. We could potentially see lava flows in our lifetimes. We could see rhyolitic eruptions. We could see basaltic eruptions. And then finally, over these long periods of time, we could potentially see these big caldera forming eruptions. From the video Supervolcano that illustrated what would a caldera eruption look like today, uh, it's a big scale event. It's a lot of magma coming out of the ground. And that's coming at some point. Most likely we will see one of these caldera forming eruptions at some point in the future, but we don't know if it's going to be 
tens of years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years into the future before we see one of these big caldera-forming eruptions.